Sick. All right. Welcome to the podcast, Bob Mack. How you doing? How you doing? I'm good, man. Yeah, I'm, I'm surprised we've never chatted before. I think you've even mastered some of my tunes before. Yeah, um, I like think. Like a compilation or something like that. On like a yeah. online compilation or something like that. Yeah, I seem to remember that one. I seem to remember a remix um, on... It was something to do with Wormhole. It came through came through Benji at Wormhole. Mm. Um, maybe, was it a Rizik thing or something like that? Maybe a remix... Uh, I, I don't funnily enough, funnily enough, I do remember the work quite well from oh, that. Nice. But I'm sure we'll, <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure we'll get to that at some point. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, I guess like uh, one of my first questions actually is why do you put the letters SC at the end of all of your masters? <laughs> all right. Well, the um, the company name is Subvert Central Mastering. And um, so that obviously got shortened to SC. Now, Subvert Central is, uh, was, is still going. It's an internet forum where um, myself and a lot of my peers, we all kind of grew up, if you want to put it that way. A lot of, you know, I kind of, in a lot of ways, I grew up in the, the drum and bass and drum funk scene. I don't know if you know that kind of stuff, you know, lots of weird drums and and break beats, yeah, lots yeah. and lots and lots of break beats. And there was a whole, there was a, a beautiful time where there was a lot of us all making, you know, everyone's trying to sort of outdo each other a little bit and everyone's, a whole scene happening, you know. And there was something really great that happened on that forum and it was kind of out of that that uh, I found myself helping people out technically with stuff because I was an engineer kind of before anything else. Um, and yeah, just from helping people out, it sort of ended up that I was spending more time helping people out than working on my own music. So um, it's sort of, uh, I wanted to, I didn't want to ever forget that that's where I started. And so the company got called that. And now it's Subvert Central Mastering or SC Mastering. So when I send something out, it's SC Master and that's that. Mm. And how did, how did you get to like, because I feel like at this point, like most of my friends send their stuff to you to get mastered. Like, how did it end up that you became the guy who just masters all the bass music? I have got no idea. <laughs> you know, I've got no idea. I think, I think most. Um, it's funny actually because I started in that scene in the in the drum and bass scene, and it probably that was around a time, probably two thousand and where are we now? Two thousand twenty three. So that would have been 2005, 2006, something like that. Um, and the like dubstep was, it was it was already started, but you know dubstep was just starting to really gain traction. I'm talking the sort of old, you know, you know the dubstep from that time. And um, dubstep forum was quite a big thing. And I was looking for people to engage with and try and build the business and get more work, you know. Um, and I posted one post, arguably, on there. I think it's fair to say that post changed my life. It was just someone asking about <laughs> um, if my kick peaks at whatever it is, what should my bass peak at? And mm. it was saying like, they were saying like, if I got this at minus three and this at minus three, and I was just all I said was that's too loud because you know six is half or double in audio. You know, so if you've got something at minus three and minus three, you're already out of space. So just turn stuff down. That was it. That was it. And then people were like, oh my god, man. <laughs> like, what is this? You know, what is this? Uh, and it's sort of, I don't know, it's strange how making such a basic post about just turn stuff down a bit. Uh, Wait, so, your, that, so your answer to the question of where should one's base and sub peak is they should both peak at negative six? No, it was a bit like, if they both peak at, at minus six, then you get, you're out of space, right? You're at zero then, assuming right. everything's in phase without getting too into the, technicalities or whatever but you know assuming everything adds up in a if you're just talking sine waves then yes six and six is zero so you're already out of space so i said you know do them a little bit lower than that and then you've got some room for some other stuff and if you find that stuff's peaking wildly then something's probably out of control so give it a little bit of control and that's it you know it was it was the simplest possible post you can imagine it seemed to me at the time it just blew people's minds on this. But you're never thread. really out of space, right? Like I feel like quite often I'll have my sub and my my kick both peaking at like plus nine, 
and then I'll just yeah. put a clipper on the master and somehow <laughs> the space gets created for them to go in there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and that um I mean that's a that's a to a certain extent that's a perfectly valid approach, but um I have reservations about doing things that way, but people do things that way and so um it's not for me ever to tell people how they should do things, but the fact remains that six or minus six or minus six leaves you at zero. So then you have to you have to use some other way of creating space, be it to either, you know, these days everyone side chains everything all the time. Just everything gets out of the way when it needs to, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. That's one way around it. That's got that's got its own problems. Yeah, it's like your kick is zero and then like thirty milliseconds later your sub is zero. And yeah, 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 exactly. Seconds later some Yeah, zero exactly. Zero. Yeah. But essentially like everything's on all the time, you know, and that's so side chaining is obviously people do it better and worse and and some people uh you know it's like five milliseconds <laughs> so it's just like you know everything's on all the time and there's no space for anything when um when side chain is done well it does create space temporarily speaking it creates space rather mm. than in the in the y-axis it creates in the x-axis x-axis if you want to put it that way and mm. um so it can be done well but there's you know whichever way you do it sooner or later you're going to run out of space so it's a case of how do you handle it so you know, you could just bash it with clipping. That's one way to, you know, to get around that problem. <laughs> yeah, I mean, as long as you've got enough of a click on the transients of things to where it psychoacoustically makes it feel like there's an impact there of a drum, I think it's fine. I mean, as long as in the end when it all gets squashed together, it sounds like a kick and a snare and sounds like there's shit happening in there and it gives off the effect of a beat happening, then, yeah, think, you know, yeah. it's like it's an artistic, creative way of doing it, but... It is. Uh, uh, but it I can do... work. I mean, sometimes I've opened sessions from people where it's like you listen to the kick on its own and they've just got like Melder's M transient on there, smashing it to the point where the kick is just like, like not even yeah. has it doesn't have a t uh, any semblance of bass tail or anything. And then all of that is coming from like some layered thing or whatever. And yeah, I don't know. Yeah. Like it's interesting looking at some people's sessions when you're like, man, that tune sounds so good. And then you look at how it works and you're like, what the fuck? Like, how does this sound so good? <laughs> well, no, but that's the beauty of it, man. That's the beauty of it. Because I can sit here in, in my ivory tower and pontificate about, oh, no, you've got to do this. You've got to have it at minus six and whatever. But I, I absolutely, absolutely. And this is kind of goes back to remembering those subvert central days that, that, it's, it's got to be fun and it's got to be musically expressive. You know, people have got to express themselves musically. And, it, and, and if, they're, if they're having fun and enjoying it and doing what's, you know, getting, that's getting what's in their head out into the world and into other people's ears, then what does it matter what I think? You know, I'm only here yeah. to try and serve that and to try and help people, or hopefully help people to, to, to shorten that distance, if you want to put it that way, between getting it out of their head and into their ears so that it mm. sounds how it does in their head. And that's kind of my fascination with this job, if you want to put it that way. Yeah, I think another factor to when it comes to writing stuff, like forgetting the mixing and the mastering, is with electronic music, it always seems like there's this kind of almost one-upsmanship where it's like, who can make the people go, what the fuck, the hardest? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah and <laughs> I almost feel like when you do shit in like a standard mix down way these days, it's harder to get that that sort of what the fuck vibe out of it. Whereas yeah, like, yeah, for yeah, instance, yeah, yeah. the first time Moody Good put out like music to go fuck yourself to and everything is just like negative 10 loss, like, you know, plus 10 loss or whatever. And it like elicited this feeling of just like, what the fuck am I listening to right now, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, I feel like a lot of the kids these days who haven't gotten like a traditional engineering uh, background or anything and they're like 17 years old, they basically don't know what a lot of the tools are doing, but they're just throwing everything at it. They're making yeah. some amazing shit that when I hear it, I'm just like, what the fuck am I even listening to right now? And I love that, I think. Yeah, 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 absolutely. And, and it's funny because I've ended up, uh, to use your words, I don't, you know, a lot of people come to me for bass music stuff and I've never made a bass music tune in my life. <laughs> so, but that's, um, it's sort of useful because it gives me a, a certain amount of distance from it. So I can't, you know, I can't, um, I can't often help people with their mixes because I've got no idea how they're doing it. You know, they, they, they could be doing this, they could be doing that. And they say, oh, should I do more or less compression? Well, I don't know. How much are you doing? <laughs> you know, maybe you need yeah, to do yeah. more, maybe you need to do less, you know. So it's, it's good for me in a lot of ways that I, 
I don't really, I just judge the signal that I'm given. I'm just given a, a mm. thing and I listen to that thing and then that thing behaves like this. So I take appropriate measures to, to bring it into balance, you know. So right, um, it's like more of a macro image approach kind of, which I guess yeah, is what but, mastering is in itself. Yeah. I, I, the question for me is I, I don't, I don't really want to change anything when it comes in. I mean, I have to mm. work with the sound, but when I AB, I just want it to sound the same. I just want it to fill the room. You know, I mm. just want it to, and that doesn't necessarily mean loud. I just mean I want to hear all the music. I want more of everything, but I want everything still to sound as it did, as they intended. You know, it's not it's not me. <laughs> I don't want I don't want to be there. I don't want to. Ideally, I don't want to leave any traces. I just want them to say that sounds exactly how it did in my head, and not understand why or how or whatever because they can't hear the stuff I'm doing. That's that's the ideal for me. You know. Right. When someone sends you something, are you um, by default trying to hit certain metrics like X amount of luffs, X amount of brightness, X amount of sub peaking, or do you just sort of go for it and just not worry about the metering and the numbers too much and just try and make it sound good? I'll, I'll, I think, I don't know, I could go on for a bit here. How long have you got? <laughs> An hour, go for it. All right. Yeah, we've got ages. <laughs> I'm wondering how big your hard drive is. No, I'll, I'll, <laughs> luffs is fine it's the best we've got but it's not very good i just want to get that out of the way i don't really rate it i don't really like it all that much it's got its uses it's fine uh but really it's just it's just rms with a high pass filter and a high shelf Ooh, yeah, you a, know like wow it's man a, uh, it's just a reference number i think yeah like, yeah, yeah totally no i oh, know but some but you get people saying right it needs to hit this number you know they come to me saying it needs to hit this number and needs to hit that number and uh, and I, I think that's unfortunate because there are a lot of ways it can sound even within that number. So, you know, immediately prescribing that number, it might be better or worse at that number, depending on various other things that are going on. And and, and kind mm. of, as far as say things like bass levels, at what, le what levels they peak at, well, it, it depends because you have to take the time domain into account. How long is that bass signal? You know, is it is it a continuous subtone which will appear louder? Is it... You know, is it, is, is it a juddery, you know, pointy, rhythmic bass? Because, you know, duration affects loudness perception. There's there's so many things that if you try and calculate it, well, you're just going to blow up. You're better off. <laughs> you know, I, I've tried it in the past. I've tried, you know, as, ascribing numbers to stuff. And, and I've always found that the, the most mature engineers, I'm not, <laughs> I'm not including myself in this, but when I was really finding my feet or whatever, you always find the best engineers never talk about specifics like that because it, it just always depends. The only rule that always applies is it depends. You know, the, mm. the bass level depends on that and it depends on what the hi-hat's doing and it depends on the vocal and it depends on this and that and the other. And if you try and fit everything, right, that's got to be at that number, that's got to be at that number and so on, then, then either you're going to make very dull music or, or it's just not going to work, you know? So it's sort of, I've, I personally, I think, or I've come, I'm at the point because it's probably going to change it. Hopefully I will develop further, but um, the, the thing is to just have amazing monitoring, amazing room where you can just judge the sound and judge its own internal balance, a, a tune's internal balance on its own merits. Because mm, then yeah. you, you're not that worried about it. You can use luffs and so on as, a, as an idiot check or... Even better is just reference material. You know, they say, right, I want it to be as loud as this. All right, that's fine then. And the numbers might be the same, they might not. But, um, but yeah, generally I take a... I, I, I don't really look at numbers if I can avoid it unless there are certain things like making sure it's not... I don't know. I don't know. It could be anything, couldn't it? <laughs> you know, yeah, making yeah. sure there's nothing stupid going on because I'm having a bad right. day or whatever, you know. Um, mm. the idiot checks but but generally speaking if I can I do a lot of my work another way to put it I do a lot of my work with my eyes closed which is oh, interesting how that's how I feel you know the way I like literally way, closed yeah yeah yeah, yeah. that's, that's oh. one reason I like analog is because I can yeah, yeah. if I put my hand there then I know that does that and I know that does that and that does that and then mm. I'm out of the picture you know, it's yeah, just going sense. in my ears and my ears are making my hands do stuff and my hands are feeding back to my ears and my brain is off thinking about 
dinner or something. <laughs> you know? Dude, it's it's crazy how much visual feedback can influence your decisions whilst mm. making music. Like I've sat there before and I've mapped, say, like EQ8 to some some pots on a MIDI controller and closed my eyes and just messed around with it or used the push or whatever to just like make an EQ decision. Yeah. And I'll be like, that sounds pretty good right there. And then I'll open my eyes and it'll be the weirdest looking EQ curve I've ever seen. And I'll be like, there's no fucking way I would have made that EQ curve. I would have thought it was crazy or that it was like, it didn't make sense or it was going to introduce too much like phase problems or something, but it sounds fine. Yeah. And yeah, I think, I think that's, uh, yeah, a big problem actually in, in producing music on a computer is the visual feedback that you get from it. Uh, is it's just what some developer decided it should look like at some point. And then it influences your decisions massively. Yes, very much so. I um, I I think there's two things there. <laughs> One is that the other day I uh, I had a f- I almost had a fire in here because uh, one of my units, the regulator, decided to give up and there's smoke pouring out of my desk. <laughs> so that was Jesus. fun. But <laughs> anyway, so after I'd um, after I'd stopped crying, I uh, I I had to run some tests and I I'd left. A lot of stuff in the chain, and I I ran Plugin Doctor. You know Plugin Doctor. Yeah, I just yeah. ran DDMF. Plugin Doctor. Yeah, 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 through the chain just to make sure all the levels were right and everything was as it should be. And I was like, man, I'd left it all patched in from the last tune. I was like, look at the state of that. You know, the EQ curve, like you're saying, was all over the place. But it was definitely right for that tune. You know, but yeah, yeah. But if I'd have been looking at that, I would have thought, nah, man. <laughs> Dude, same <laughs> thing. Like, there's a specific EQ that I love to use on vocals. It's called CEQ by Sound Toys. Right. And the way that it boosts highs on vocals, in my opinion, just gives them this like really nice shimmer that just sounds really good. And I've just been doing this for like six, seven months. And then I was like, I wonder what it looks like. So I put it in Plugin Doctor and it's this giant <laughs> peak with this like big tail ass like high shelf thing on it. And I was like, oh, I wonder if I just like do that same looking curve in EQ8 if it will sound basically the same. And it did. It sounded basically yeah. the same. I was like, huh, all right. So it's not actually the EQ at all. It's just the curve that it's producing. Yeah, I guess like an EQ is an EQ. It literally just pushes gain at certain frequencies or it doesn't or it cuts them, you know? It depends. It depends on uh, a like lot of 90% things. of it is the curve shape and then whatever other coloring they decide to add to it. But that's Poss- minimal. Yeah, like. but then uh, partly like I'm a, I'm a big fan of, of passive EQ. Like, I mean, actual passive EQ because the... The inductors used make a difference to the sound in you know in terms of how they behave in the time domain hysteresis and all that stuff so you know uh, in the analog world um and I, I don't know some i'm sure there are plugins that do this but i'm just used to using this stuff you know it's it sounds like what i you know what i want things to sound like in my head but a higher boost with say my portal grinder active eq the high shelf with that and not just because of the shape, I've tried matching stuff like that compared to say, I've got a fully passive uh, thing from this German company, 51 dB audio, and the height is just completely different. You know, it's just, there's something about the way those components work and the, the gain stages used or not used in the passive EQ and so on, all that stuff kind of makes a difference. And to, the, the reason I mentioned this, oh, sorry, kicking my stand around. The reason I mention this is not to pontificate about analog gear or whatever. It's just the simplicity of knowing I like that sound on that thing, so I'm going to use that and not having to recreate some complex curve. You just grab that CEQ, right, turn it yeah, up, yeah. sounds wicked, done. You know, yeah, yeah, if, if, I need, if I need snappy, tight, high end, I'll just go for the portal grinder. If I need it to be just soft and probably the most beautiful thing I've ever heard, <laughs> the high shelf on that. 51 dB thing is just it's just beauty you know but it's, it's it's a whole different thing they're just different but I don't have to think about that stuff I don't I'll just mm. reach for that one I'll just reach for that one and that decision's yeah. made and I'm on to the next thing so yeah no I agree with you I think a lot of the time hardware is not necessarily about the fact that it can do things that you can't in other domains like digital or other pieces of hardware or something it's just yeah. that to do those certain things wouldn't occur to you on the other platform because it would take ages. It would take take ages ages or it just wouldn't even occur to you because the curve would look too weird or it just, it's not Mm -hmm. set up to specifically uh, intuitively make you do that or whatever. Yeah, exactly. Um, I'm curious though, what what kind of speakers are you running in your studio? Uh, Key 3 BXT. (laughs) Oh, no way. I'm running the Key 3s in here too. I don't have the BXTs though. I wish. Get them, get them. Do they make a big difference? 
Yes, I have to say they do. There's a, there's a very long story here. Uh, is it, is it the, uh, my main question is, is the biggest difference they make the amount of headroom you get? Or is it, does it actually like represent the sub a lot better? Both. The, the, the harmonic distortion in the low end, you know, crossover region and below, having done many tests, I'm a nerd, man, you know, having measured yeah. all of it a million times, uh, the THD is, is disgustingly low with the BXT in. It is, that shouldn't be allowed, you know, to have distortion that low. I can't remember the numbers off the top of my head, but I've got them all saved somewhere. But, yeah, because um, I do notice that the distortion that comes out of these, if you push them a little bit, is kind of fucked. And yeah. they definitely have a lot less headroom than my last speakers, which were the Barefoot MM27s. Right, okay, So yeah. I've considered getting them specifically just to have more headroom, but it's a, it's a lot of thousands of dollars just for a little it bit more. It is a lot of money. I, I was quite fortunate to just speak to someone on the right day where there happened to be some ex-demo1s knocking around. So, uh, um, so yeah, I was very lucky to get them at a reasonable price. Mm. Um, but they, they were actually quite difficult to integrate into my room because a lot of the purported benefits of them are that they negate the floor bounce to a large degree, whereas in my room they actually made it worse. So I've had to right. uh, install a lot of floor tracking. Did you get a did you get a big spike at about thirty and some big dips at seventy and one thirty? Or was that uh, like a problem? Well, no, the the main dip around, yeah, the fl typical floor bounce dip, I forget exactly, 140 odd, I think, in my room at my distance, at my listening distance. Mm. Um, it got much more pronounced um, due to, presumably, the multiple drivers arriving very close together, but not exactly the same time. So it went from being a single pronounced dip at 140 to being quite a wide dip around 140 and much deeper because of the multiple arrival yeah. times from the multiple I've got, drivers. I've right? got the same thing as well. The exact same problem in my room is occurring yeah, right now. Floor bounce is the hardest thing to fix, man. And that's half the reason I went yeah. for the BXTs. Now, in other people's rooms, they work all right. In mine, they don't. I can feel myself getting angry. And after a lot <laughs> of back and forth with Key, and they basically, this is the first time I've spoken public, publicly about this, and I don't want to bad mouth them or anything. Their speakers are the best I've ever heard. But mm. uh, they basically told me I was talking shit, despite me sending... I took my entire studio apart several times. Um, I'm poor... You know you know, Matt Davis, isn't it? Yeah, he's the one who, who's going to... He's going to come and align my room here in uh, September because uh, recently I got one of those U-mics, the ones from Mini yeah, USB, right. to do some measurements. And I was making my mixes in here a little brighter than I would like. And I'd go listen to them in the car. They'd be a bit too bright. Live, they'd be a bit too bright. And I was like, what the fuck's going on? Because the, like, the sub in here is like seems reasonable. And then I did some measurements. And yeah, I got a, like a 10 dB spike at 30 hertz, a 10 dB dip at 70, and then a 10 dB dip at 130. So mm. it's like, and, I'm, and his theory is that it's a overtone series. And he thinks if we build tune traps um, and yeah. throw them back in the corner and tune it to 30, that it might knock out the whole series. Yeah, it might so be, yeah. We're, we're Maybe that, the, but, the, yeah. The, I'd be looking at the floor for that 130 thing personally. So I put yeah. a rug down. I don't know. It's probably not going to do much. It's like, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Bass will um, just laugh at the rug and just go yeah, straight yeah, for it. Yeah. That's what yeah, I've got. So yeah, how do you do floor trapping? Because you obviously you can't like sit on a fucking panel. Well, I'm fortunate. I sit, uh, what, eight and a half, nine feet away from my speakers. So I have okay. essentially halfway between me and the speakers, I have a whole, <clears throat> a whole set of custom built floor trapping just base traps but horizontally on the floor big like, mothers what 20 inches deep kind of thing or? yeah yeah something yeah. like that yeah. so like kind of like these ones on the back wall yeah they're yeah they're easily i'm looking at them now they're about that yeah they're serious hmm. so it doesn't look i mean they they look pretty enough you know they look aesthetically pleasing enough but everyone walks in and go why you I'm got gonna, them things on the floor i'm gonna it's try like, well, this shit as soon as i'm off this call yeah just get some like i mean you can if you've got I have spare, some more of these these big traps back here. I have like ten more of them upstairs, so I can yeah, just yeah, yeah. come and try. Right, you might here. be surprised, man. And if you can angle it in such a way that as much on the way down from the speaker and then back up, if you can angle the bass trap like this so that it's going through as much of the trap as possible, you might be able to soak mm. up quite a bit. So you can angle the trap to get it, you know, to get as much air flowing through the trap as possible. See how it goes. Mm. Rather than it only going through four inches or whatever. Yeah, you know, that makes sense. Because the yeah. keys, the design, they say, they told me that they were designed to work in a non-treated room. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they, they do well because, but that's the, the main benefit, the best thing. That, sorry, I'm babbling over you now. <laughs> oh, no, can you, can you tell I love this shit? <laughs> um, <laughs> But the no, main this, benefit, this is super interesting to me because I literally have these exact same speakers and I'm trying to solve the exact same problem right now. Sometimes. Yeah, well, floor bounce is one thing, but the one thing they do solve extremely well is the rear radiation, the speaker boundary interference response at the back. And that gets lower with the BXT. That is to say the mm. cutoff point where SBIR is less of a problem gets lower. So I forget now, it's been a while since I thought about this, but it's something like 45 hertz or thereabouts where they... And for those people listening who don't have any idea what we're talking about, because there's probably there might be someone listening to this that hasn't tuned the, out already. <laughs> the, si the simple the simple thing is basically like the way that sound bounces off the wall behind the speaker is less with these because they have drivers and they cause some sort of phase cancellation, right? Yeah, yeah. They um, bass is omnidirectional. You know, pretty much everyone knows that. So the bass travels out of the speaker backwards, hits the front wall of the studio, and then comes back to you. So you get a you get a comb filter in the bass. You get, you know, regular notches like you were talking about in your bass response, um, and that is the hardest. That is the hardest thing to fix in a studio, in my opinion, mm -hmm. because it's a time domain based problem in the low end. Very, very difficult. So yeah, with their clever design, they've they've taken it out of the equation. Plus, my studio here is in a. Uh, it's at my house, but it's at a log cabin at the end of my garden, your backyard, whatever you want to call it. <laughs> And the external structure is wood, so I lose a lot of bass that way anyway as well because the external structure is wood, so the bass just goes right through it. So um, I'm in a very fortunate position. It was one of the reasons I chose to move here <laughs> um, because the structure was already there, and I saw that and thought, this is great, man, because a lot of the bass just travels straight out. And then you yeah. add the keys on top of that and then build a studio inside it with all this in mind. And my bass response in here is ridiculous. Like ridiculous. Mm. So, um, like it's yeah, basically put, by ridiculous, you mean it's like flat and very controlled, or do you mean it's like, yeah, it's minus? I can't remember again. I should have checked all these. I didn't know we were going to go in this direction with this chat, but it's something like minus three, 11 hertz, I think. So, it's oh, wow. flat, yeah, it's flat to 11 hertz up to, yeah, these speakers, man, they produce sub in like a way that I've never heard produce like not even on big sound systems like it, the the clarity of the sub just without even the bxts is kind of insane yeah well when you get the bxts you might have a smile on your face i'll say when not if yeah i'm definitely <laughs> <laughs> wait so um are you doing any dsp alignment using the filters on the key control or are you nah, just like... I, do, I do a little bit of eq um and after trying every, well, almost every room correction software and blah, blah, blah available, um, over the years, I've, I've gone full nerd on room correction and came back to realizing that actually when you get the room right, just a little basic EQ is all you need. Mm -hmm. You don't need yeah, all that yeah. stuff. It actually just makes like it worse. Just like a shelf or something. Yeah, just a little like bit at the so top. It doesn't sound too harsh. I think yeah, and I, I, like, people... I, like, I like to feel bass. So I have a bit of a bass lift and then when it goes out, it's, yeah. it's balanced. You know, that's just, I just like bass. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I've done the same thing in past studios because like a completely flat room actually sounds like shit. Yeah, it sounds boring, like, ex yeah. well, it or, sounds or, like it's, it kind of sounds harsh. Yeah, like it doesn't yeah, yeah. sound yeah. doesn't sound right. So quite often, yeah, especially for riding rooms like this one, I try to get it like almost flat and then put a yeah shelf basically so there's less highs, more lows. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I have a little lift right at the top, but generally actually I was quite interested. This is so dull. I can't even believe I'm even <laughs> I thought this was something I only thought about and no one else ever cared. But actually I did um there's a house curve, I forget the name of it now. But when I overlaid that on my final response, and it's like, oh, actually, I've ended up pretty similar to, there's like, they did a whole raft of research, didn't they, back in whenever that was, 60s or 70s, mm -hmm. about, you know, the preferred listening curve for yeah, a the wide variety. Fletcher thing or whatever. No, nah, not Fletcher, not sensitivity is, but people's preferred EQ in a room. And they took an average of... Um, I took an average of the preferred curve, the house curve for all these people. And yeah, it ended up that mine was actually really close to that. When I thought I was such an exception or whatever, it turns out I'm <laughs> the same as everyone else. <laughs> yeah, fair. So, yeah. And are, are you doing this little lift with uh, something like EQ, APO and like ProQ or something? Or are you doing it with the actual key filters? Uh, uh, I did it with the key filters, but it just got to be a bit annoying if I wanted to change it. 
So mm. I just do it with DMG Equilibrium, which is my preferred digital EQ. So yeah, that's simple. That's the one by, um, who's it by? DMG. D Damage. DMG, yeah, that's the one. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, a lot of mastering engineers like that one. Matt Davis likes that one too. Um, mm. I don't know, man. I, I, I've i used it a bit. I, I, what do you think of Kirchhoff EQ? Have you used that one a bit yet? Or? Yeah, I use it a bit. But it's a bit buggy on my system. It's quite annoying, actually. Um, but I think it's it's a sort of... Um, it's a nice intermediate step between something like Equilibrium and Pro-Q. For people that like Pro-Q, you'll like Kirchhoff because it's, you know... It's, basically, it's the same it's, thing. It's a, a rip-off, <laughs> <laughs> let's be honest. But it's a better-sounding rip-off. Uh, it's I think basically. It, I think it sounds I, better. I, I honestly think it sounds the same, but like my right. preference with it is that the dynamics are a lot better. Like you can, yeah, you can set it to say like when it goes below a certain amount to do this, and when it goes above a certain amount to do this. Yeah, so you yeah, can like yeah, yeah. really get like a certain area of the mix to just stay there and not move at all if you want. Yeah, exactly. Which or is move, actually kind or, of hard or, to. Or very often move more. <laughs> yeah. 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 But but for that. For that stuff. In fact, that's probably. I think that's probably why I think it sounds better because I've not run any tests or anything. But I like that stuff about it. I do like the dynamic expansion, and I find that a lot. Uh, it's the the, the dynamic, dynamic expansion in Pro Q is pretty well done considering how automatic it is. You know, it's really no brainer, isn't it? You know, the stuff in Pro Q is is it listens quite well to transient. So if you cut and then put it back when the drums hit, you know, you can get things feeling more dynamic and so on. And it does that quite well, but you can do that much better with Kirchhoff. You can get that a little bit more nerdy. But above that is DMG Multiplicity, which is superior to all of them, in my opinion. <laughs> oh, interesting. I'll yeah, if you want to get nerdy, you want to get nerdy, go and spend <laughs> some time with Multiplicity, man. That's that's the one. So I'm curious, are you also like pretty good at construction? I feel like most mastering engineers kind of have to be because they're like in the search for this perfect room all the time and they're constantly <laughs> having to like build new walls and shit and like rip walls down and like... No, nah, I'm better than I used to be, but that's that was a low bar. That was a low starting point. I um, gotcha. I'm I'm good with I'm good with principles and not so much the execution. Um, mm. I can point to someone and say, "Put that thing there because of this," <laughs> and then <laughs> and then they do it much better than I could. You know, I'm uh, I'm blessed with a certain set of skills and very much not blessed with other skills. And while I've had to learn quite a few of them, and I've got a lot of rock wall in my eyes and my teeth and my you know. If you've ever treated a studio properly, then you know Matt Davis oh, yeah. knows what I'm talking about. <laughs> you know, yeah, yeah, no, I, 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 I treated this one. <laughs> yeah, right. This, this room I'm in right here was actually built from scratch. Right. My, um, when I moved in here, I had my friend. His name's Gardner, who helped Matt build his studio. Actually, okay. Uh, he built this one from scratch, which was really nice. So, in all of the walls is just like stuffed with rock wool, and then it's yeah. obviously also got treatment all over it as well. Yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, building a studio, it's crazy, man. I, I feel like people often don't appreciate how much like science, but then also hard labor goes into mm. making a really, really nice room. Yes. Yes. Actual. Like behind me here, behind so this is I've got this big diffuser wall behind. Behind here is uh, seven and a half feet of base trapping. Yeah, and it's all uh, it's like nested, so it's not just packed. It's it's got air gaps mm. all the way. So there's treatment, air gap, treatment, air gap, and the way we did it in this sort of nested, layered fashion, and doing that on a hot summer's day, and you can't see, and you've got rock wall in your head, and just yeah, everywhere. Oh man, yeah, that's. That's hard work, but it's seven worth and it. a half feet is yeah. ridiculous. Yeah, it's quite a lot. Wait, so yeah. it's so what? It's like a like a foot and then like half a foot air gap and then a foot and then or something yeah, like some that, or? some something like that. Yeah, yeah. And is the air gap for like refraction basically as it goes through? Or? Um, one of oh, you got you're going to test my acoustics now. Uh, but one of the one important thing is a change in med a change in medium is quite important in terms of. Uh, uh, air speed and air, or air velocity, air energy. Um, it, so you're you think of it as like hitting multiple walls rather than just hitting one. Mm. Um, yeah, it's so like each time it hits one, it slows down exponentially es again. Essentially, yeah, 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 yeah. Some mm. something like that. But someone somewhere is going to correct me and tell me why I'm wrong. But uh, as far as I can possibly recall, a change in medium is very important in terms of uh, absorption and so on. So yeah, so mm. you're placing yeah, as well sense. as that, you're placing multiple boundaries away from the hard exterior boundary of the building. So uh, 
you know, placing boundaries at specific wavelengths for, in terms of room modes, you're putting a boundary at a different room mode. If that matter. I've not explained it very well at all. But um, yeah, there are there are solid technical reasons for doing it, so that's that's why it was done. Mm. And the ones on the sides back there are they the same thing or? Uh, these ones, no. These are they're designed by my acoustics guy. Um, they're his design, but they're, they're generic, fairly generic QRD uh, diffusers, just uh, two dimensional diffusers. So the way I have the room is that the front end is basically dead with some diffusion around the top. Um, and then at the back, I have some diffusion to return. The, the rear half is slightly reflected. It's basically live end, dead end, but done a bit differently to that. So all this stuff around here is porous, so the bass can get out, but I keep enough of a signal to make it interesting and pleasant to listen to in the room. But I get a diffuse uh, room return, mm. um, which makes it not at all dead and very pleasant. It sounds lovely in here. It's, I've got another studio, we built another, well, I built another studio, what was that, eight or nine, maybe 10 years ago, uh, which is the one you see on the website, which is still in the company, but my, I trained up a guy, Leon, who's really doing well, and um, yeah, I've, he, he runs that studio now, so um, he's taken on looking after that place, and that's a bit bigger, that one, um, and that's in a self-contained warehouse uh, all by itself, whereas this is built inside a log cabin, so it's a slightly different construction. This one's a touch mm. smaller, but um, and we managed was to... the one you built in the warehouse? Was it sitting on like mass loaded vinyl or something to decouple it? Or no, we didn't bother because um, it's on. I forget how. F this is a long time ago now. My memory is not all that good anyway. But um, uh, we didn't decouple it because it's first. It's on the first floor, and it's this is old school industrial. So the floor. I don't even know how thick that floor is. It's so it's. It's the first floor and that floor is, I don't know, it's like a metre thick concrete or something. And underneath, fortunately, is, um, uh, well, now it's a bakery. It was something else, but it's not, they're not driving trucks around or whatever underneath. You know, there's, there's mm. minimal noise from downstairs anyway. Um, so while we could have gone deeper on the construction in terms of the floor there, we decided that given the costs and, and the hassle and the potential benefit, we decided it wasn't worth it. But certainly in measurements, yeah. it never came up. Um, and I, I went back there, it's about 100 miles from here, so I got up there every now and then and, um, and <laughs> helped Leon fix stuff, you know. <laughs> but um, but last time I went up there, I walked in and was like, Jesus, this room is nice. You know, I sort of, I forgot, you know, I worked in there for seven or eight years or something. And What um, kind of monitoring is in there? Uh, that is PMC IB2S with a pair of Rhythmic Audio F12G subwoofers. And yeah, the PMCs are real nice, man. Like, I was pretty content with my room until I went to Matt Davis's room like two, three weeks ago and heard his PMC MB3s, I think, or something like the big ones. Yeah, yeah. Um, and he had them in like like a perfect room and I was just like, holy fuck, the center image in here is crazy. The stereo, yeah. like everything about it is like the center image, the stereo, the balance. Like it, it just instantly, these problems that I'd been having with certain tracks on this album I'm working on, I was able to just like solve them and felt like I could trust the decisions yeah. I was making. And, and I was like, oh, fuck, even, I need to. Even something as simple as like really, really simple as a, a mono signal. You know, everyone sort of takes that for granted. But when you've heard a proper mono pinpoint signal, it's, mm. it's quite something because, you know, the, the left, right, uh, the image in between left and right, you know, the, 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 uh, the inter-audio correlation coefficient, I believe it is, the IACC, is when that's very strong, then, and it's, I forget what it is, I measured that as well here, it's like 96% here or something, which is very good. How do you measure that? Uh, there's... Software. <laughs> uh, um, yeah, the inter-audio coherence coefficient, I believe it's called, uh, IACC. There's a bit of software, one of the room treatment or room correction things I mentioned earlier, Accurate has got that built into it and it will tell you how strong the, the, the correlation is. And obviously it's good to have strong correlation in the early portion of the signal, like the first 30 milliseconds or thereabouts, and then later on to have a decorrelated signal so you're not getting, you know, room reflections 
after that that are all correlated. You want that decorrelated. That's why we have diffusion and stuff, right? If that makes sense. Mm. So, yeah, but yeah. as far as the early signal goes, my room is very, very well correlated. And when you hear just a plain old, like a some old dub thing or something, you know, that's just mono, and you're like, and it's right there. <laughs> it's right there. But something is fundamental is that like to go to what you were saying you know something that's fundamental like that people sort of take for granted as mono but suddenly you can really trust your you know because it's so precise you can trust all your panning you can trust all your you know when you move away from mono you know that the center is correct you know your imaging is correct you know that where you put things is where they are and so on in terms of mixing you know so it just something as simple as that when you can represent mono perfectly like that then it means that everything else will be that much better represented right and matt i mean i've never spoken but we've had a few messages and stuff over the few years and i've got a huge amount of respect for that geezer he's that geezer really knows what he's talking about <laughs> matt davis you know, you know yeah you know him personally right? oh yeah yeah i so, know him really well yeah he's a great friend of mine yeah he's he does know his shit like yeah, he definitely yeah yeah, yeah. He's tuned most of my studios for me. Not this one yet, but um, he, he will. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> you look, you got a feeling of dread that I, like come across your face when you say hey, he's going to come here and ruin it. <laughs> nah, nah, nah. He's, every time, he, every time he leaves a room, it sounds ten times better than when he got yeah, in. Yeah, but while he's there, it's a wreck, right? You know, he's tearing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's all pulled apart. And he um, he made me cut my desk in half the other day. He was like. <laughs> That geezer. Just, just uh, I, I, I was like, we we're doing some preliminary shit like before he comes, so we can like plan before he comes and and stuff like that. So, I was doing some measurements, and he's like, "How big's your desk?" And I measured it, and he's like, "Cut it in half." <laughs> so I got my friend Gardner to come over and cut my desk into like now it's like this big versus like yeah, right. massive before. Yeah, 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 yeah. And then yeah. I took it took another measurement, and there was this huge dip at one k that like fully came back after cutting the desk in half. So he was yeah. right about that. Yeah. But yeah, I've thought about doing not doing the same exactly, but the desk I use here is a uh, they're a company called Session Desk, and they make a they make a series of desks where you can basically make it one wired or you can buy a couple of bits, take it apart and put it back together to make it two wired or make it three wired. It's all like modular mm. basically. And I've, I'm, I've several times talked about the idea of going back to a, a single desk in front of me and just the two side racks. But um, I've just got too much gear. I just love my mm. gear. And Yeah, you have you to do? balance <laughs> as well. You have to balance between a room that you actually enjoy working in and a perfect sounding mm. room because the most perfect sounding room like an anechoic chamber is fucking dog shit to be in you don't <laughs> want to be in there for more yeah. than like 10 seconds because nah, it's, nah. it's uncomfortable to be in a it's yeah. uncomfortable because of how it makes you feel because it's so quiet but it's unco like you can't have a desk in there you can't have a chair in there to get it sounding perfect like that no. Um, so yeah, I think it's always you, you can't like even I, be in there you can't even you can't even go in yeah, there <laughs> technically yeah <laughs> Yeah, so I think it's important. Like, for instance, when I was working in Matt's room the other day, I could only work for, like, 20 minutes, and then I'm like, I need to take a break. This is uncomfortable. Like, sitting at a, his mastering desk, which is, like, the size of a keyboard. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Doing some work in there. And, and, like, yeah, it sounds great, but it's not it's not super comfy to work at. But I guess with mastering, you kind of only want to work in short bursts anyway. You've got to give yourself a lot of breaks. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I, I mean, I... I use my D key a lot on my keyboard, you know, which is my dim, you know, so I'm dimming stuff all the mm -hmm. time. I do a lot of work at minus 20, just particularly things like, um, say you're coming to the end of an album and it's almost there and you, like checking levels of the whole album and just needle dropping around the whole album, you know, here, there, here, there, here, there, checking that song, that song versus that song, that song. And I do a lot of that at minus 20. Um, that is monitor level and just making sure that even at those very quiet levels, it all still sounds perfectly balanced at very quiet levels. I'll do quite a lot of stuff like that, not just to save the ears, but I just kind of like working that way. And one yeah. thing about one thing about the keys actually is that they behave very well in terms of uh, working quietly versus loud. They don't, you know, when I turn it back up, it still sounds the same, just louder. Do you know what I mean? Whereas with some speakers, yeah, yeah. I've I've had reservations about that. Whether they're true or not, I don't know, but. It's funny, no, I agree with you. I, I think the keys definitely represent stuff quietly, and I do the exact same thing. If I'm trying to find a balance between stuff, like turn it right down, especially with vocals, yeah, I'll turn everything yeah. right down 
to where you can just hear the vocal and then, then when you turn it down, like it's the last thing to disappear and mm. as you turn it up, it's the first thing to appear. Mm. It's a good way, I think, to get to make sure your vocal is like just above everything else. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly, yeah. Really Fletcher Munson, man, all. using the Fletcher yeah. Munson to your advantage, <laughs> isn't it, you know? That's yeah, cool. exactly, yeah. That's, that's, that's where nerdy stuff can be helpful. I don't know, I find myself, I'm always... Um, I'm interested. I don't. I still can't figure out if I'm a scientist. I mean, I'm a scientist by background, but I've, it's just funny. I measure everything, and I, I'm highly technical and and all that stuff. But I've spent most of my time trying to forget that shit and just work, you know, and just uh, and be musical about stuff. You know, it's it's an well, interesting electronic music is specifically a balance between those two things, right? Because yeah. It, in essence, is a technical thing. You're basically trying to wrangle a computer to do things to, to generate emotional. emotion. And, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. And <laughs> so you kind of have to go between the two, I think. And I, I feel like you get a lot better at that after you've just been doing this shit for like 10, 20 years because mm. then it's like the, the technology is just you know how it all works. You're not thinking about it too hard and, and you can just try and concentrate more on the actual vibe and stuff like that. Yeah, 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 exactly. And it's... Um, it's it's interesting that you say that. I've, I've, anyway, I've thought about that quite a lot just lately because I'm desperately trying to find some time to make music because I haven't done it in you know once upon a time I used to make music and have fun and and it wasn't a job. I'm not complaining. Don't get me wrong. I love what I do, but I don't get to express myself at all, and I miss that. I do miss that immensely. And now it's a case of if I'm going to make music, how am I going to do it? because I'm going to have to go back to like using Cubase 5 and stuff because I'm not going to know, <laughs> I don't know how to use Ableton. I'm scared of it. I'll have to go back to the things I know because otherwise <laughs> I've, got, I've got to learn a whole new load of software. Oh, I can't be bothered with what that. Are, what are you using for mastering? Are you using Reaper or CD yeah, or something? Yeah, Reaper, yeah. Reaper. I like Reaper yeah, because of the, well, I like a lot about Reaper, it's got to be said. I like yeah. uh, custom actions, custom scripts. You know, there are things that used to take me ages that I can literally press a button and it does it for me and, and it's mm. right. What's an, you know, what's an example? Uh, say copying automation for something. I automate almost every tune, virtually every mm. tune that, that is here, you know, to make sure that, to say basic volume automation, to make sure that there's one thing I hate is when breakdowns are louder than the drops. What's all yeah, that about? If you just... <laughs> I was saying to some people, yeah. so just sit on, your, sit on your hands and press play at the start and let the tune play through and let it drop and be honest with yourself <laughs> does it all get quieter you're probably compressing too much you know or you can compensate anyway so, that's, so one that's, reason my, that's my rant why, over one, one reason why that might be and I do this a lot is because when I'm writing I do smash my shit extremely hard and then I force the dynamics in by putting a gain control at the end of my my mastering chain, which is just a clipper. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I turn the breakdowns down by like two or three dB, and then right before the drop, I have it automate down like another six dB. Yeah, and yeah. When it drops. It seems extremely. Yeah, 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 exactly. But so, it's still clipped. So when, it's still cl clipped in the intro, right? So it's clipping the whole time. But like yeah. <laughs> when I when I send it to a mastering engineer, they are like turn everything off on the master. So I turn everything off on the master, and then it's. That's why it's like that, because I, I turn I the see, gain control off as well yeah, on the master, yeah. which ah, I right, should right, just right, leave right. that bit on. But yeah, that's yeah that, in be, electronic yeah. music, that's pretty standard for someone know, to it, to force the dynamics in that way. Yeah, yeah, it's it. It just it seems to me that that I don't know. I'm, I'm it's it's hardly a laborious job, you know, to to do it. But mm. it's one thing that uh, it should be. In my opinion, it's part of the creative part of writing the tune, right? So maybe you you've done it. You know, you do it because the tune doesn't feel right to you as the artist if you don't do that, right? But whereas I, I get it a lot, and where things are just the balance is completely wrong between, and that's I'll say that that's not just my opinion. It's pretty objectively wrong that the the intro is three decibels louder than than the part where it's meant to be loud. You know what's going yeah, on yeah. there. So oh, anyway, yeah. anyway, I'm moaning now, but, <laughs> <laughs> but but when it comes to Reaper, you know, if I draw that automation for say one parameter, say volume, but there might be something else that needs automating as well to, mm. you know, as a part of that, um, then I can like the I can press a button and it will copy all the automation 
for all of those things across the whole album, the whole project with one button. So I'll copy it for that song, for that song, that song, that song, that song. I haven't got to go through and manually copy that one, manually copy that one, manually. <coughs> little things like that. It's not the best example. It's not like the most mind blowing example, but just little things like that. They save you so much time. And, and you know, 10 years ago or whatever, that was crazy talk. You know, that was like, yeah. I know Reaper was <laughs> going 10 years ago, but I'm relatively new to it. I'm only five or six years into Reaper, but. You know, yeah, I mean, it, it's good that you pay attention to that stuff. Though, like, I've definitely given my stuff to mastering engineers in the past who haven't paid attention to that, and then I'll send them my master and be like, "Listen to my master. Like, it has dynamics between the sections, and like your one is just like the whole thing is like loud or whatever." And they'll be like, "Well, I'm not gonna like automate everything. Who does that?" And I'm like, <laughs> I'm, "Apparently you, and apparently me." So I have my wrist. <laughs> I've got a ver I've got a vertical mouse, you know, to keep my mm. wrist in a natural position. And even with an anti-RSI my anti-RSI mouse, my wrist is is starting to complain a bit. Yeah, so that's why I find all these sort of not shortcuts exactly, but just helpers, you know, to 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 save my wrist because I'm I'm doing that step, you know, zooming right in, getting it right in the right place for every song because because it's, it's got to be right. It's just got to be right, or at least. Mm so that I'm as sure as it can be that that's what they wanted, that that's how it feels best for the music, you know? And I'll drive myself mad I'll, on all of it. I'll, I'll care, I'm, I'm getting emotional here, man, but you know, <laughs> I care so much like that, that when someone listens to it in 10 years time, I just, today actually, I had a geezer, get in touch. The last email in the thread was from February, 2013. And <laughs> and he came back and said, I don't suppose you've still got this master, have you? So I, f I dug out the old hard drive down here in my stack of old hard drives, you know, and f I've still got it. So I thought, ah, oh. it's always, any anyone who's worked in this game a long time, when you, if you hear something from 10 years ago, you know, yeah. it's like, oh shit, man, this is not going to be pretty. But it sounded great. It sounded really nice. And I was so pleased because there's probably things that, not just my work, but but musicians that listen to stuff from ten years ago and think, "Oh dear Christ, what was I doing?" You know, <laughs> and and not just musically, but also sonically. You know, like I think of uh, which, the eighty. Which track was it? Uh, it? The one from today, you mean? Yeah, yeah. Uh, prop. What was it called? God, that's really bad, isn't it? <laughs> I can tell you his what name is his name is Carl. Uh, I'll check on my phone. Propaganda, I think it was called. Where has he gone? By, by Carl. Uh, get dressed, we're going out. The artist is proper, spelt as in proper, the word. Ganda, as in uh, Avaganda. Okay, I don't think uh, it's not coming up on on the internet, so. I don't know if it's actually out yet. I think he might, you know. <laughs> he hasn't put it out from 10 some, years ago. Some yeah. artists have a long lead time, you know. Like, <laughs> but, um, well, long, longest rollout plan ever. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. He's just steadily building towards world domination, man. But, um, so but, yeah, but it was on? just nice. It was just nice to hear that thing from 10 years ago and not be embarrassed. And when I, sorry, I've just got to wrap that little point up. No, no, it's, no, all right. it, yeah. it's so yeah, fundamental course, yeah. to my life, you know, and that's why. I, I sit here for hours and hours and hours and hours and hours and hours missing family dinner and whatever because I'm just, it's got to be so that, like I say, in 10 years' time, when they listen to it, they're still proud of it. You know, they still think, mm. I'm, gla I'm glad we took that time or I'm glad I used that guy or I'm glad I made those decisions and all that kind of stuff. You know, like when you listen to 80s music and it's just gated reverb and like really bright gated reverb and they're, put, I don't know, maybe they're just listening going, oh God, what were we thinking? <laughs> you know, and maybe clipping will be like that or whatever, you know. But um, Yeah, possible. I mean so Yeah, but that's that's audio though, it goes through trends, isn't it, you know? Yeah, that's a hundred percent true. I think the solution to that for me is just to spend like a lot of times coming back over and over again to the same session. And mm. I feel like uh, my ideals for where things should sit mix wise and also musically and vibe wise, obviously, is it's too hyper specific on any given day. Like on one day I'll be like, mm. oh man, like this needs so many vocal chops in it and it needs all this brightness and it needs like clipping and compression. And then I'll come back like two weeks later and be like, what the fuck was I thinking? I need to remove like half of those vocal chops. I need to split the difference on the clipping and the, and the brightness. 
And I'll come back like two weeks later after that and be like, well, now it needs more like 808s in it or something and more sub and it needs more of this. And I feel like if I just come back to it enough times, it takes like a big enough snapshot of all of my ideals that yeah, it yeah, makes yeah. Uh, a Mr. Bill tune at the end of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, uh, you seem to be doing all right that way, <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah, I appreciate it. No, what, are you, what are you working on at the moment? Like uh, what, what have you been mastering this week or today? Well, today, actually, the last thing I did before I shut up shop today was for uh, Deep Dark Dangerous, mm. um, a release coming. I don't know what I should say. I won't, uh, you know, or not or whatever, but there's a release coming for them. So, But I mention it because I should say thank you to Tristan yeah. um, because it's his fault that you have to put up with my bullshit, right? <laughs> yeah, no, as soon as he mentioned <laughs> it, I was like, oh, like my first thought was that I should talk to you because... I obviously I know about you through your mastering work and I one of the reasons your name comes up for me a lot is because I use Soothe on like everything and you have a <laughs> and you have a preset in there that makes me laugh. It's a it's like a DS uh but the pre the preset name is just like DS and that's that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And I was like I so. use that every now and then as well actually that one. Yeah. Yeah, it's I don't know. The like, preset names can be I try and have fun with them when I when yeah, I get yeah, to do totally. them. Like uh, the ones in uh Tone Projects, Kelvin I had some, I've got a bit, he told me to, he had to, he had to edit a few of them, let's put it that way. But um, I don't think, you know that plugin, Time Projects, Kelvin? No, by Kelvin? Yeah, Saturator. Time Projects by Kelvin, I don't think I do. Uh, other way around, uh, huh. it's oh, Kelvin, Time Projects, the company bit. Yeah, it's, uh, huh. I don't I've really use this. a lot of Saturators, but it's, it's truly excellent. You must be aware of the Unisum, their compressor. Uni by Tone Projects. Yeah, the, no, the, I never never heard of this company before actually. Oh, Baselane. Oh, I know. I know Baselane. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Baselane's yeah, pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah, they're um making some of the nicest sounding things out there, if you ask me. <clears throat> yeah, Baselane but, um, is solid. I tried it out the other day, and I was kind of impressed with it. Yeah. Yes, it's tremendous. It's it's just about. I mean, something everyone does is mono the low end. You know, you have to mono the low end. <laughs> Maybe, but. Uh, if you're going to do it, use that because mm. it's the only product I know of that does it the right way. There is a there is a there is a best practice way to do that if you're going to do that stuff, and that's the only thing I know that isn't sort of homebrew style that does it the what, right what way. What is it that what is it that it does that allows the sub to be stereo and not fuck up mono compatibility? Uh, when it comes to adding stuff, you mean, or do you? So you said Baselane is the only product that you know of that does what it does to bass the right way, and what it does to bass is basically add some like psychoacoustic stereo ness to it, right? No, you can do that if you want, but in terms of just monitoring the low end, you know, below whatever hurts, um, I think what. Oh, you're saying it mono stuff the right way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, you can Wait, add what is, psycho. What, what is what? the right way and what is the wrong way? Well, the wrong way is to use. Any generic high pass filter in the sides, that is the wrong way to do it on the master mm. bus. And that is Cause something of the that. Because of the phase issues, you mean? Or? Yeah, because in. So <laughs> in MS, in the side channel, a phase shift in the side channel, when you convert it back to left right, correlates to an image shift, right? So say your cutoff frequency is, let's just say, 100 hertz, right, for the sake of argument. Now, as the high pass filter goes around 100 hertz and you're, you're monoing the sides, or rather, you're cutting the sides, when you convert that back to LR, at the point of 180 degrees phase shift, so around a cutoff point on that filter, right? You know what I'm talking about here. You've got a, there's yeah. a point where there's a 180 degree phase shift. Stuff that is on the right is now on the left when you convert it back mm. to LR. So you end up with a progressive skew from left to right around the cutoff point and the worse or rather the sharper the high pass filter you use the more extreme and more uh, aggravated that that stereo flip is so around the cutoff point you've got a point where stuff is is crossing over from one channel to the other and once you hear that shit oh man you can't unhear that you hear it everywhere all the time so the sort of simplest way to do it and the way baseline does it um, is to do it linear phase because then you don't have the phase ramifications and therefore you don't get the image shift, right? So you can use any generic high pass filter linear phase in the sides. That works perfectly well. So you can homebrew it and do it the right way. 
Base lane does it in a way that allows you to make it variable, as in how much you're monitoring it. You don't have to rigidly monitor it 100%. Allows you all kinds of different cutoff frequencies and slopes and whatever, but also crucially, it allows you to reintroduce the stuff you're losing from the sides into the mono content, should you so wish, in a controllable way. And it does that. The way it does that is, uh, I don't actually know how it does that. I missed out on that conversation, but um, that goes, that all goes to Ian Stewart. Big up Ian at uh, Flowtown Mastering, and that's why it says about it was his idea and the way he implemented that reintroduction of the the stereo content. And there are other plugins that do it, but they don't do it right. They just don't do it right. I call Ian Mono Man because <laughs> he's he's like the 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 authority on monoing stuff in the low end. He's he's uh, he really knows what he's talking about there, and that whole the way it. Uh, recovers stereo information is it's the only plugin I know that does it right and there are a few others trying to do it now but uh, they didn't pass the monoman test so <laughs> yeah fair enough um, anyway sorry you, that was a right you... babble sorry god this, is that not really boring no I find it interesting <laughs> and, I, and I think like I mean there'll, there'll be people who find this interesting you know like yeah. go and get go and get bass lane the, the geese are deserves your support you know like if no you, if i you, i yeah i, I have it yeah i think it's yeah. great um have you fucked around with atmos much no i can't no. afford to and my yeah. it's expensive <laughs> my, yeah my inkling is that it will come and go i could well be wrong but um i it's just not really something i'm that interested in in mastering personally mm. i um i don't know perhaps i'll change in the future but i'm sort of taking my work in a different direction in terms of um for largely romantic reasons i'll be cutting vinyl quite soon so oh I'll cool you're going to like start a vinyl pressing plant or are you just going to be mastering for vinyl just just cutting cutting records <coughs> you know when i think mm. when i go back to my earliest days putting out music and Wait, when you say of, cutting a record you mean physically cutting the record yeah cutting the lacquers yeah the oh, the master the original blank master that goes to get <laughs> I'll just kick my cat. Shit, dude, she's got a lizard. Oh, man. Oh, oh <laughs> she needs God. to go and sort that out. No, she'll sort it out. <laughs> yeah, you'll find it in about five hours' time. Yeah, Yeah, maybe in her litter box in a chunk of her <laughs> shit. She's definitely going to eat her fucking... Oh, yep, um, I think she's, uh, she's eating it, yep. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Sorted. Problem gone. <laughs> yeah. Um, but, yeah, anyway, I'm, I'm going in that direction, which is probably daft and you know purely like i say for romantic reasons but i got into this because uh well i was engineering and then i was going to mastering sessions for for my music and sitting there and seeing bo thomas uh who's now at 1087 mastering who i have to, i couldn't not give him a big up on something like this uh i owe that geezer a lot uh seeing him cut records what well, it was actually one of these sessions <laughs> was I remember I was cutting one of my tunes called Way of the Small Thought and there's this riot symbol in that tune which is just ah, like you know really ah. and I remember being there and he was just working and we're chatting and he's just doing the mastering you know I didn't really know much about it at the time except the speakers were great you know and um, and he said oh there's that ride symbol whatever it is six kilohertz or something and I just said to him how, how do you know that six kilohertz he went, well, when you do something every day, you just know, don't you? I thought, I want mm. that shit. <laughs> I, want, I want that. I want to do that every day so that I know that's six kilohertz, you know? And mm. I remember that had a profound effect on me. And uh, that was like, why am I not doing this? This is what I should be doing, you know? And mm. so, you know, fast forward all these years later, that was probably, yeah, 2004, 2005, something like that. And fast forward... And now I'm here and I'm coming back around. So now I want to do that. I want to, I, I don't know, there's something beautiful about vinyl. Yeah, whether you look, you know, whether there's a future in it or not, I don't know. But there's still something. There's a lot of cancerous materials in it. I know that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well. Polyvinyl uh, chloride, not very good yeah, for you. Yeah, no, it's Make not Make sure the best, you wear no. a mask while you do it. Well, there's a, there's a Hoover, you know, that, uh, mm. uh, a vacuum that takes all the chip away. So you haven't got to worry about that, hopefully. Um, so yeah, I'm getting. I'd still still wear a mask just in case. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I'll keep that in mind. <laughs> Thank you. Have you, watched, uh, have you watched Ben Jordan's video on on vinyl? No, no. Oh, send, send me a link, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, yeah. yeah. 
Sick. Well, hey, man. It was really nice chatting with you. Uh, I think there's someone at my front door, so i got to go get it. All right, but, cool. Yeah, so I hope I haven't babbled too much. I feel like there's a million things we could have talked about and stuff, but... No, um, not at all. I definitely think that this is, like, exactly what I was expecting, like a very technical <laughs> kind of talk. It's generally <laughs> the case when I yeah. chat with, like, someone who does mastering or acoustics. Yeah. Well, I hope it wasn't too boring for anyone listening. I hope they made it through. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure they did. <laughs> all right, cool. <laughs> Uh, right. Bill, nice one, man. Nice one. What can I say? Thank you ever so much for having me on, man. I appreciate it. Yeah, of course, man. Well, I appreciate you taking the time and yeah, have a good evening slash day. All right. You too. Take care, man.